The following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about them, Cowboys? Yeah! Go Cowboys! This, this is Talkin' Cowboys. Streaming live from the Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters at the Star in Frisco. Howard streaks in! Streaks in! Touchdown! Parsons has second! Prescott keeps it! And he bangs it into the touchdown! And now your hosts, Isaiah Stanback, Nick Harris, John Mashoda and Kyle Yeomans. It's a Monday edition of Talking Cowboys presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company, the official coffee of the Dallas Cowboys. Welcome in to the SW. WBC Studios at the Star in Frisco. I got the hiccups, guys. Sorry. You have to forgive me for a little bit here. I have some remedies for that. Yeah, it's a little bit of a hiccup, just like the Cowboys had a hiccup in week three. I see what you did there. 28 to 16. Was that scripted? No, it wasn't, actually. That was right off the rip. Off the dome. That was off the dome. That's professionalism right there. (laughs) Yeah, uh, things didn't go well in Arizona. Nick Harris landed at about 1030 last night. That's good that uh, the team got off the plane. In Dallas, because it didn't seem like they got off the plane in Arizona. It didn't yeah. look like things happened well for the Cowboys. Uh, just, I mean, for the most part, that's what it is. I mean, this is a bad Arizona team, yeah. and the Cowboys lost to a bad Arizona team. Don't, you don't think so? I didn't agree with it last week. I don't agree with it now. What, what did you? What, what was your score prediction, though? Yeah, I predicted that Dallas would win. But I also stated that I felt like this team is a problem, you, right? And so I mean, like, wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, Arizona is not a bad team. Arizona is a team that's figuring themselves out. I think they're an undermanned and depleted team. I, I agree with that statement, right? But they're not a bad team. Dobbs is figuring out this team. He's only been there for a little while. The head coach is figuring this team out. He's only been there for a little while. Like, they have some pieces now. They, do they have the level of talent that Dallas has? No. Absolutely not. Should they lose a Dallas on paper? No, absolutely not, right? But in terms of some of the things that we talked about last week. They reared their ugly head, right? We knew that they could run the ball. We knew that their style of running was right. going to cause problems. We knew that Dobbs had a cannon. We knew these things. Like these, there was there wasn't anything that happened that we were surprised by, right? We knew these things. These these problems were prevalent, but Dallas just didn't didn't check the boxes to take care of them. Yeah, yeah. The running game especially was yeah. awful. Um, I, it makes me wonder if these running game problems still exist. It just took a while to get exposed again. Um, I mean, 182 yards given up in the first half on the ground, um, most uh, for the franchise since 1991. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I, whether it was James Conner, Joshua Dobbs, even Rondale Moore got back there and went 45 yards untouched to the crib. Uh, it was tough, man. It was tough. What? No, I was just going to say, like, like, just referencing some of the things that we addressed last week. I mean, mm-hmm. this is why people should tune in because like, we try to. We try to send the alert signals out, the back alert, signals alert. out. Yeah, like we talked about, I know at least I did specifically about this is type of running offense, right? That it's this different. is very Philly-ish, right? I said it's mm-hmm. very Philly-ish, right, in terms of the zone read, in terms of those things, and how they're able to take the defensive ends out of the game. That's what happens when you have a quarterback who's capable of running, and he hurt you, and he, and he made you aware of that very, very early in the game, right? He lets you know, hey, I can get out on you, so all of a sudden now you're like, crap. I can't be as aggressive. Now I have to rel- I have to respect the fact that he can run. So now, guess what? I can't pinch and, and restrict the running the running gaps as I, as I as I intended to because I have to go out here and respect the fact that he might bootleg out of it and keep the ball. Right? And I can't just be as aggressive because they have the zone read and he could pull it or he can give it. So either way, I'm, I'm creating seams. That's created problems for Dallas in the past, right? And that's why we referenced that. Like Jalen Hurst, the Philadelphia Eagles, they were able to run the ball against Dallas in recent times because mm-hmm. of that style of offense. And everybody who has that and has the capability to actually run it with their quarterback has been successful against Dallas. Now, do you do you you acknowledge it and you try to address it? It doesn't mean that you can stop it. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think Dallas is at right now. They know that they struggle with that type of offense. We knew that they struggled with that type of offense, but they still couldn't stop it. And that's where I think people have a big concern right now. You talk about rushing yards allowed last season when, of course, it was a big red flag about this Cowboys defense. Nasty defense. One of the best in the NFL still is. And, yeah, they're going to have a lapse every once in a while. But run defense has always been a bugaboo. 240 yards was the most they gave up last year, and that was in Week 8 against the Chicago Bears, yeah. running quarterback, yep. Justin Fields. A lot of that came from his legs and the way he was able to run the football. This would have ranked second on the list, 222 yards allowed against Arizona. This would have been number two on a list of a bad run defense last year as most yards allowed. Yeah. So it's not a good thought process. Uh, it, you, like you talked about, the 
the point of focus throughout the entire offseason was let's sure up the run defense. Let's go get Amazi Smith. He's been relatively ineffective, if not completely real ineffective through the first three weeks of the season. He's a rookie. He's got 14 games left, hopefully more than Correct. that. There's still time for him to make an impact. He just hasn't yet. Correct. But to this point, is there a red flag still for this Cowboys defense saying this is still a problem and it needs to be fixed? I mean, after yesterday, I don't think there's any other conclusion than yes. Um, it, with Joshua Dobbs and James Conner, I mean, both of those guys were able to find their holes. And, man, they found a lot of yardage in those holes, too. Taping so. Holes. Um, Man, they were flushing out the the, the, mm -hmm. def the defensive line. Uh, Michael Parsons was completely flushed out of the game at times. Uh, Demarcus Lawrence, in the same sense, whenever they ran to his side. I mean, they attacked the middle of that defense early and often. Yeah. And it was the, whether it was Jonathan Hankins, Osa Digizua, Mozzie Smith, Leighton Van Der Esch, those guys, they just weren't able to get downhill. And yeah. um, I, I think that's what eventually led to what that first half lead looked like. And then trying to climb back into it with this offense, which I'm sure we'll dive into the offense a little bit later later i have my thoughts on that as well sure. but um i i think it it, it just kind of created the perfect storm it created the perfect storm of identifying what the problems were and a it's still the run defense and then b there's got to be some juice on offense yeah and i, I want to save the offense to the second segment because there's there is like nick just yeah. said there's a completely story different storyline around the offense but i think that the significant storyline in this game and probably at the top of the list is the fact that the defense collapsed the way that it did it looks it looks so good in weeks one and two against good opponents. I'm not going to discount the Giants yet. I'm not going to discount the Jet Jets yet. But both of those teams on paper are better than what this Cardinals team was. But then you turn around and you say, okay, the defense has a performance like they did in week three, and it doesn't get much easier. You got the Patriots coming up this upcoming week. You got Bill Squared. You got Bill Belichick, Bill O'Brien running that offense. Then you got the, the running back duo of Ramondre Stevenson and, oh, this guy that of course, wants to get at your throat, and that's Ezekiel Elliott. Those are the run game coming up this week against New England. So where does it start defensively? Where do you want to see the biggest uptick? Because it doesn't happen – it usually doesn't happen overnight, but you kind of need it to happen overnight this week. I mean, you got to start today. You know, everybody, all hands on deck, coming in here and watching film mm -hmm. and yeah. really – having a heart to heart with everybody everybody gets their grades so all those things happen but if it's normally a two-hour session make it four right we really have to get really in tune and really particular about the things that need to improve um in this in this scheme and i think that they there are a more advanced rushing defense against base runs okay right so when you have a Brees Hall and Dalvin Cook and you're able to shut those guys down, those guys are lining up and you know where they're going. They're mm -hmm. coming downhill, right? Or they're going just outside the box. I think that stuff is traditional. They're good with that. They sure that up, which is awesome. But this this new this new little wrinkle, right? Or not a new wrinkle, right? But this that 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 option, you know, uh, version zone read, yeah, concepts. zone read concept is just it's uneasy. It's really uneasy. Oh, man. And then you look at it from the passing perspective. I know everybody's going to pay attention to the rush defense. This dude, Dobbs, was able to throw for 81% completion rate. Mm -hmm. And these weren't these weren't hitches. He was effective. These were not hitches. You know, there was there was dropped coverages. I mean, you know, J. Lou's getting back into the system, but that big play, you know, was J. Lou dropping coverage. You know, it was man-to-man -man coverage, and apparently he didn't get the call that he thought it was three. So he was staying in the zone, and a guy ran to the open spot of the field and was able to. Is that whose fault it was? It was J. Lou. Okay, was. I was curious. I haven't yes. been able to go back and watch yeah. that on film. From from what I understand about the defense, yes, yeah. Yeah, it was J. Lou's uh, fault. I um, mean, just look at look like a drop in coverage and the safety kind of throwing his arms up in the air, and like what the heck, kind of gave me a confirmation of that um then you look at deron bland he's struggling on the outside he struggled yep. you know we talk about um gilmore like gilmore's good but gilmore don't have the juice that he that he used to have you know so like are we really there's do you really have an expectation of him to keep up with guys who were four three yes yeah, stefan gilmore really struggles with speed yeah. I, I think that's starting to become a little bit more prevalent we talked about it coming out of the jets game just like oh Gary wilson kind of got him a couple times rondell moore got him yeah mm -hmm. rondell moore just we, we talked him. about what we, what did we say before Speed four three speed across yeah. the board like you have to stay on top of these guys yeah right you can't come up here and press like you've been pressing everybody else up like give them space respect it right and play downhill and, and unfortunately it just didn't work out that way so there's some there was a lot of kings and everybody's gonna say well you know we we're missing guys on defense Trayvon was missing on the defense and offensive line was in shambles and yeah those are all true statements but it doesn't mean that you can all of a sudden just say hey we played down. 
You know, and that's I think that was a statement that I think everybody's kind of up in arms about right now that, you know, we played down to our opponent. You can't say that you played down to anybody until you played them at least once. Yeah, I don't think with the offensive line struggles that they had, well, excuse me, the offensive line replacements that they Correct. had to make, three out of five uh, starting offensive linemen um, having to be replaced, and then Deron Bland having to fill in for Trayvon Diggs. Neither of those things lost the game yep. yesterday. And I think that's the big, biggest takeaway Correct. that people need to kind of look at and see see what this loss was caused by. It was the rush defense and the fact, you know, as we said, we'll get into the offense later, but yeah. mm-hmm. offensive problems as well. And it was neither of those things. It was yeah. neither of those things. I really like the way that Babe Loffenberg put it. He, he tweeted it out last night, and I, I just thought this was well put. He said, he's, I say it all the time, and I said it before the game today, not making an excuse for a sloppy performance, but this is not Alabama playing Middle Tennessee. Where as long And nothing against Middle Tennessee, the Blue Raiders. Where as long as the bus doesn't break down, they win. Arizona has NFL players, and I have a source tell me that they also play. They also pay their coaches. It happens. I mean, that's part of the NFL is you can't, like you said, you can't play down to your opponent until you play them. It, it certainly, from a talent standpoint, looks like Dallas played down to their opponent, and it looks like that. But you also, this happens. It does, and it happens to good teams. Sometimes it happens to great teams. I've got a, a, a couple of instances. I'll pull it up as I'm talking here, but where great teams – rebound from losses like this good teams will lose games that they shouldn't and they'll lose them a couple times throughout a season great teams rebound you go look at the 92 93 and 95 cowboys they lost to losing teams each of those years 92 they lost 27 23 to a four and six rams team in 1993 they lost 27 to 14 to a four and six falcons team in 1995 they lost 24 to 17 to a a four and nine Washington team. I almost said the old nickname that I shouldn't say anymore. And then if you want a recent example, you want something else to throw into the fold, how about the Kansas City Chiefs last year against a bad Indianapolis Colts team? Guess when? Week three of the NFL season. Week three, they lost 20-17 to on the road to the Indianapolis Colts, a team that was winless at the time and a team that, of course, ended up being right there at the top of the, the, the NFL draft. So there's there's thought process around, oh, this team is the same old team. Nothing is off the board just yet. You got to find a way to rebound, though. If you don't rebound in a good way, then maybe you are just another team. Mm. This team still has a chance to be great, but it's how they rebound these next three weeks in really tough matchups. That's going to really show what this team is made of. Yeah, we had a point last week. I, I believe it was you, Kyle. It was saying, what do you want to see more from this defense? And what do you want to see more from this team as a whole? And I think we just said consistency. It was like, because last year there were times when they would go three, four weeks where it was a really rough stretch. It was Jacksonville, Houston, you know, that that stretch in like the middle to late part of the season. And um, it, it kind of felt like that yesterday. You know, it kind of felt like. It, to me, it felt like they played down to the opponent, and that uh, I mean, they said in the locker room after um, that they got punched in the mouth. You know, that they didn't expect this. They they came out flat, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's a really good opportunity here to rebound. I like that it came at this point in the season, <laughs> especially with the adversity that happened this week with Trayvon uh, yeah. Trayvon Diggs going down, with the offensive line going down so late in the week as they did. Uh, but it's a really good opportunity to bounce back, and you have three really good opponents before the bye week, so you're you're gonna have to you know put this one behind you quick and and get going man yeah look at the the schedule coming up for for dallas because it's not only new england next week who's coming off of a win and i don't think the patriots are scary by any means but they're certainly a a formidable opponent and they've got bill belichick it's a good head coach it's a really good opportunity to bounce back yep and then of course everybody has already had that week five matchup on the road in prime time against san francisco followed by another prime time matchup the week after that against los angeles Patriots, 49ers, Chargers, bye week. And then you got the Rams and the Eagles right after that. So it doesn't slow down. It, it doesn't. And these are three crucial games. I think you got to win at least two of the three, if not all three, if you really want to be in position to where you want to try and fight for that number one seed in the NFC because now it's it's keeping pace. Now, now you got to find a way to keep pace with those teams around you, including Philadelphia, which – if we're talking about Philadelphia schemes and Philadelphia lookalikes, they they still look like Philadelphia at times, even though they've had their own fair share of struggles in their two wins. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even be honest with you, I'm not even there yet. Uh, <laughs> but I think this was the most Philadelphia-ish team that we've that we faced, simply because their defensive coordinator, obviously, and some of the things that they do offensively, and 
it, sh- it showed up, you know, and people could write it off all you want to, but that's the reality. That was that was my concern going into this week was that, hey, they do Philadelphia stuff on defense, and then they do Philadelphia stuff on offense mm-hmm. in terms of their, their running scheme. So it presented a problem. I mean, people could say, oh, it was just a one-off game or all you want to, but this style has been a problem and a pain in their butt offensively and defensively. What what was the feeling like in the locker room afterwards? Was was it disappointment or was it more of just a an, an anger or wh- wh- where would you kind of? I wouldn't say there was any lay. anger, um, just because I, I know what those those angry losses look like at times. Um, I, I would say more so disappointment. Um, I mean, Jonathan Hankins, uh, he's he's got a really good personality and he's just kind of able to you know be really personable and especially in situations like this. And we were able to talk to him in the locker room after, and he was like, "Yeah, man, we got punched in the mouth." You know, mm-hmm. he kind of he laughed like not laughing like and not taking it seriously. You know, it's just it is what it is. It's an any given Sunday type moment, and um, I, you know it kind of reared around it and uh, reminded everybody yesterday. Uh, yesterday kind of gave everybody a slice of humble pie in a, in a, in a sense um, you know everybody talked about you know uh, uh, it, them being humbled um, you know Dak Prescott was saying he kind of took it upon himself saying uh, you know we, we I, I have to do better we have to do better as an offensive group um, I, I think the, the good thing is is almost everybody took responsibility yesterday because I think there was responsibility to be taken uh, in every position group yesterday I think the only position group I can look at and be like you know what they did as much as they could have done was a running game and mm-hmm. um, you know I really like what they did but aside from that I think there's improvements to be made across the board let's talk about the offense uh, let's talk about some of the things that that went wrong red zone still a big glaring red flag for yeah. this Cowboys team and, and what they could possibly do there and is there a a lack of trust between play caller and quarterback I want you guys to answer that question when we come back here on Talking Cowboys Todd thought it would be secure to jog in the cheetah savannah. Todd believed the big cat repellent he bought online was reliable. And now Todd is trying to be faster than this cheetah that can run 80 miles per hour. But the good news is Todd has AT&T 5G that is fast, reliable, and secure. And he learned the best thing to do is stop running and toss her the backpack with the beef stew. AT&T 5G. Fast, reliable, secure. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan and device. 5G may not be available in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. Black Rifle Coffee Company serves premium coffee to people who love America. When you drink Black Rifle Coffee, you are directly supporting veterans, law enforcement, and first responders in your community. Black Rifle's expert roasters love coffee almost as much as Texas loves football, so it makes sense that America's Coffee partnered with America's team. Go online at BlackRifleCoffee.com and fuel up with the official coffee of the Dallas Cowboys. That's BlackRifleCoffee.com to fuel up today. Cowboys fans, after that move, we've just coined the term Rowdy Replay. Let's roll back the tape. Okay, there's our mascot Rowdy cheering on the boys, and now he's on his phone on his Bank of America mobile banking app? Staying on top of his finances with his virtual financial assistant, Erica. Bank of America's digital tools are so impressive, Cowboys fans just can't stop banking. Learn more at bankofamerica.com slash can't stop banking. Erica is only available in the English language. You must download the latest version of the mobile banking app, only available on select mobile devices. Message and data rates may apply. Member FDIC. Welcome back into Dear Doctor, the show where I answer life's questions with an ice-cold can of Dr. Pepper. Sheila, let's hear from our next caller, would you? Dear Doctor, my friend supported me during a tough time, but what's the right gift that says, thanks for being a shoulder to cry on? Okay, this one's easy. I say give her a delicious Dr. Pepper. Nothing says, thanks, girl. Better than a -a one-of-a-kind soda. Yes, any Dr. Pepper flavor will do. Now, just a reminder that I don't need to be a real doctor to know that Dr. Pepper is the one you deserve. Back to Talkin' Cowboys. This portion of Talking Cowboys is brought to you by Quaker Oats, a super-trusted superfood. Quaker Oats, the official oatmeal sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys and of Isaiah Stanback. Hello. You already downed those things. The oats are gone, Kyle. Mm, got it done. There you go. Super-trusted superfood. The segment also brought to you by the Dallas Cowboys Fan of the Year, presented by Captain Morgan. All right. Let's talk about the offense. We've already hit the defense. Defense, mm. for the most part, uh, was the storyline collapsing giving up 222 yards on the ground not pretty from that side of the ball but it wasn't perfect offensively either able to move the ball effectively I mean that was not a problem the Cowboys put up 416 yards of total offense Dak Prescott finishes the day 25 of 40 250 yards through the year 
touchdown interception. Like Nick alluded to, Tony Pollard, 23 carries, 122 yards. Didn't have a touchdown, but his first triple-digit performance of the 2023 season. What were your overall takeaways, Nick, when it comes to this offense and, and what you saw on Sunday? Man, I loved the fact that they were able to march downfield. Um, man, third down efficiency was uh, remarkable yesterday. It felt like... 9 of 16. Yeah, it felt like at times you didn't even want to watch first and second down because you knew third down was where it was going to happen by the end of the play. It was like... It, or by the end of the drive. Um, there was one drive specifically where they drove down the field, uh, battled two penalties, battled a sack, and battled three third downs and got all the way down to the red zone and couldn't score. And mm. I think that was just a, the the story of the entire game yesterday was the fact that they were able to march down it didn't matter where they were pinned down to they were able to get inside the 20 and things just stalled out so five red zone trips yesterday only 10 points to show for it um Dak Prescott said it after the game he's like the fact that we couldn't score in the red zone is why we lost this game that's the story of this game period um so uh, red zone execution you know I, I think you know we may have talked it down in a sense in the first two weeks like we had we had talked about it being a, a, a problem it. for mm -hmm. sure but i don't think i don't think we realized how big of a problem it could be and i think it showed its ugly face yesterday for sure i want to go back and and clip the actual conversation that we had but it was like okay they won the game against new york but, they looked great but the red zone was a problem and yeah. you can't go five of five brandon aubrey field goals later and, and feel like that's a good thing going against good teams i mean that was Ultimately, what we said last week, did we realize or did we think it would happen in week three against Arizona and it would rear its ugly head immediately? Probably not. But it was certainly a talking point that showed up again in week four or excuse me, in week three. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an issue. You know, first two weeks, like you said, we tried to write it off as, ah, OK, they'll figure it out. You know, Coach McCarthy's getting used to the system. It's a problem. It's a problem. It's, a, it's an official problem. I think week, week one, we're like, nah, hand over the buzzer. Week two, took the lid off. Week three, You're hitting the buzzer. Yeah, You're hitting the buzzer because this, you can't. You you're being you're too efficient on offense to get down there and not take advantage of completely take advantage of the yeah. opportunities that you're presenting for yourself. And as dominant as your defense is, you're still putting them in a bad predicament mm -hmm. every time you go down there and don't capitalize off of the red zone opportunity. So, to the next point, you're moving the ball. That's awesome. Rushing the ball, throwing the ball. Okay, highly effective. But then you get down there and things are restricted and you're not making decisions quick enough. Your play calling. I, I like on the interception that Dak threw, I get it. I've I've ran that exact play like a gazillion times before in practice and in the game. And it's it wasn't there. It just wasn't there. On that particular play where the ball was supposed to go, it just wasn't there. So one, Dak, you have to you have to make the right decision in that particular instance, and then two, you know, I th also I say Dak, we need you to use your legs, bro. Yeah, you have to use your legs, man. Like there is a couple times down there where if, when you're facing one on one, and people are gonna say, oh, but he's a quarterback. Nah, you, I'm not. I can't hear that, right? Like as a competitor, I have one on one, and I need five yards. Like you're not getting me down. That's that's my mentality. I can't speak for another man, yeah. but my mentality offensively was you're, one man's not getting me down. And I want Dak to get to that point if he's not already and then start utilizing that because it's going to help him. We talked about it in camp. The, his, he was using his legs in camp. Dak was in practice at least. We saw in the first two weeks. Yes, okay, yeah, we yeah. saw it. So, but like that has to be prevalent. Yep. He, like He has to bring that aspect to the game because otherwise it, it negates what you're, what you're capable of doing offensively and they won't respect it. And if they don't respect it, then they don't have the scheme for it. Yep. I think uh, I think also what plays into this is they don't have a red zone weapon. Uh, CD Lamb is probably your best red zone weapon, and he's not the biggest guy in the world. He's not going to out physical you. You know, he could probably go up and out jump you and yeah. head top you a little bit, but that's not going to be as reliable as you know what Dez has been for this team or what uh, you know Witten was for this team mm -hmm. or even Ezekiel Elliott uh, all the way up until last year. You know, they don't have a bruiser at tight end that can you know go up and, and just out physical mm -hmm. you. I love what Jake Ferguson has actually done in these first three weeks. Uh, let me say that. Like even yesterday, there were times I was like, day. man, Ferguson looked good. Um, but they don't have a guy that can just get in there, get his nose dirty, and go get those yards. And I, I think that's probably the root of this issue. But also just very simplistic play calling that they put out in the open field, trying to do the same thing Down. within close quarters yeah. in the red zone. And, you know, when you're running, you know, mesh concepts in the red zone, I just don't feel like that's the best the best thing to do in the world. I mentioned this yesterday on a postgame show, but the best weapon 
in the red zone, right? You talked about the root of the problem. I believe the root of the problem for the Dallas Cowboys in the red zone is the inability to run the ball effectively down there. Mm -hmm. Because when you're able to run the ball effectively down there, yeah. then all of a sudden all the attention get placed, gets placed on the run. Right? So then everybody has to respect it. You have to respect it. If I could literally line up and I'm going to say, hey, we're on the five-yard line. We're about to just run through your face. And we're going to push your entire line and in linebackers back, backwards into the end zone. And we're going to do this every single time we come down here. Now play action becomes prevalent. Now I can do a whole bunch of you know different releases and everything else I want to yeah. do, right? Misdirection and all the other foolery that you see down in Miami. Like You could do that because I can line up and literally just run the ball at you all day long if I want to. Dallas doesn't possess that. We were excited about the potential of that because of Tyler Smith coming back this past week. Tyler Smith comes back and you lose three other guys. I, honestly, I don't feel like the red zone issues even yesterday, where the the offensive line was a was a huge facilitator. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking about the confidence to be able to line up. I see what you're saying. Okay, they I, move guys off the ball, right? Okay. Yesterday was not a day yeah. where you felt like okay, I, you know, with three replacements, I could feel like I just move anybody off the ball, regardless yeah. of who, who I'm playing. But when Tyler Smith comes back and you have your first your five starters for the first time ever, that's what we were referring to last week on the podcast. Like we felt confident that this running game was yeah. going to really get going, and that Coach McCarthy in the red zone would now be like. Psh, here you go. Yeah. I don't care who has the ball back there. right? We're going to move you guys off the ball. You were excited about that potential, and you didn't get a chance to see that because all of a sudden you are missing your guys. Yeah. I'm looking at the play propensity. Is that how you say it? Propensity? Oh, we looked at you for play, pronunciation. I know. I'm the, I'm the, <laughs> the pronunciation guy. Me. Play propensity is, I think, what it is. Yeah. It's on one of the NFL statistic websites. And I'm looking at it. Percent of pl passing plays in the red zone on goal-to-go -go scenarios. So whenever there's a yard marker, so let's say there's one yard to go, two yards to go, three, etc., all the way down. It's how many times a play is called in a certain scenario. In Yard in goal to go scenarios for the Dallas Cowboys in 2023, anywhere from two to six yards, it's 100% passing plays. 100%. Anywhere from two to six yards, it's 100% called a pass. I mean, that is an unbelievable amount of number. The only one where there's a little bit of a skew in terms of the run or the the run game is whenever it's yards to go at one. That's it. That's the only That's one where strange. it's where it's 100% run. So how many plays does it say? I was looking for snaps. I can't find gotcha. snaps yet. But I, I, that'll be part of my weekly research because if that number stands the way that it looks like here, that's certainly a problem. I think for the most part, there's a there's a storyline. There's a bit of a there's a bit of a, a conversation among Cowboys fans right now, and I, I'm asking this question not because I believe the answer is yes, but because I think it is a question that needs to be addressed. But I've had multiple people send it to me on Twitter and whatever. It, does Mike McCarthy's play calling indicate that he doesn't trust Dak Prescott, specifically in the red zone play calling? If I'm looking at those numbers and those numbers are correct based off of this propensity, I'm saying I don't think it has anything to do with the trust of Dak Prescott in the red zone. Uh, I, I will say the offense yesterday was really dumbed down. Um, mm -hmm. I don't feel like there were there were um, opportunities to get guys open downfield. Um Again, we've talked about how they were able to march down the field, but when you're you have those long, methodical four, five, six minute drives, when you get down to the red zone, you're gassed. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it was more so just like a gassed sense. You know, I want them to take more shots in the open field. And I think does it have to do with trust? Does it have to do with not having three starters on the offensive line? Who knows? But I I would have liked to seen more shots taken downfield and a little bit more trust in that game, just because there were opportunities to do that yesterday. There was a moment where C D Lamb was wide open for about a 45 50 yard touchdown mm -hmm. Dak just missed him but that was the only opportunity that I had saw during the game yesterday I was like oh my god someone got got open downfield you know I want to see a one one thirty drive where they go down the field, uh, you know, seventy five yards in that in that type of time. But when they get down to the red zone, uh, it's it's I think it's more of a gas sense. I don't think there's a lack of trust in the red zone at all, um, just because again this entire offense was constructed around Dak. They wouldn't have done that if there wasn't trust there. But um, it, it may just be an energy thing. Yeah. What do you think? Just from being a former quarterback, being in those situations, in those huddles, does it do? Is, how big is a trust? Let's just let's shift the question this way. How big is a trust between Mike McCarthy and a play caller whenever you are in a situation like that? I Mike mean, McCarthy and his quarterback, I should say. Yeah, I mean it's everything. I don't I mean I don't think it's. It just comes down to decision making, right? I mean, but I think your I don't think your confidence. 
varies with your quarterback based upon where you're at on the field. I don't I don't believe that. I think that he has wholehearted trust, and I think they probably have a relatively good relationship. They have to. Um, head coach, quarterback, head coach, offensive coordinator, and those relationships are, are, are knit tight. They have to be, otherwise you get Chicago. Um, so... Um, I don't. I don't foresee that. I mean, the people are going to obviously look for talking points. I don't think that's an issue. I just think that they have not been executing. Is conditioning an issue whenever you're running a West Coast offense? Because kind of like what Nick was talking about, you're running deep into down scenarios. You're running third downs. You're you're converting on those third downs. You're moving the chains the way that this offense was built. Is there a conditioning issue, or is it just based off of the fact that I mean, there is. there's not a whole lot of trust I mean, in the I offensive they ran line? Seven, they ran 80-some-odd plays last week. They ran 75 plays this week, I believe. Mm -hmm. You're getting up around that 80-play echelon. Most times, most teams are running 60 plays. So, I mean, yeah, conditioning plays a part in it, but that's, again, it's not the reason why they're not being successful. It's, yeah. it's just not. They're just not executing. Like, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not an excuse guy whatsoever. It's mm -hmm. just they just are not executing, and they have to figure it out. 34 minutes and 33 seconds mm -hmm. uh, time of possession yesterday. Yeah, they won. I mean, they they held the ball. Yeah. They were doing things effectively in the open field. And when, just, when they got inside the 20, it was just, uh, who knows? <laughs> when the defense gets gashed for big yardage on the ground, too, I'm sure that helps out a little bit. It's a little bit. It happened a couple yeah. times. So, But I... I mean, even we talked about it. This is an offense predicated on moving the chains. They did just that. They had 26 first downs. They were moving the ball. They were effective on third down. 416 yards is a lot. It's a good, that's yeah. a lot of yards. No, that's a good day. Sorry. And you, had a, you had a 100 yard rusher. You had a quarterback that threw the ball effectively for the most part outside of the interception late. It just it, it didn't work out in the red zone. That's, that's the one big knock on this game is the red zone is glaring at this team, and it's something that has to be figured out. Yep. Speaking of getting figured out, this this injury situation Oof. wasn't good. I mean, when we were on the air Friday, we thought we were having a first time all year, first time since 2021 that yep. all five offensive linemen were available. That didn't happen. Let's talk about the injuries and what could happen next for the Cowboys when we come back with more Talking Cowboys right after this. They say champions are remembered, but legends are never forgotten. United Ag and Turf offers a winning lineup of John Deere equipment built to tackle any challenge on and off the field. Legendary John Deere tractors, combines, residential mowers, commercial mowers, compact construction equipment, gator utility vehicles, and a full line of golf and sports turf equipment. United Ag and Turf, the official Ag and Turf equipment supplier of the Dallas Cowboys. Visit unitedagandturf.com to find a location near you. Are you ready to take coffee off your grocery list forever? Black Rifle Coffee Club is here to help. As a coffee club member, you'll get your favorite coffees roasted, packaged, and shipped to your door free of charge on your preferred schedule. Set it, forget it, and never run low on coffee again. Members also get exclusive deals on coffee, products, and discounts from partner brands. Ease your mind and let Black Rifle worry about your coffee supply. Go to BlackRifleCoffee.com to join the coffee club today. It's the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys, Jack Black. And right now, Cowboys fans can get 15% off their $75 order. Plus, because every deal needs a playmaker, your order will include a free five-piece skincare set and free shipping. The Jack Black Playmaker is four of Jack's favorites and a full-sized intense therapy lip balm. Make a play for the playmaker at GetJackBlack.com slash Cowboys with the code CowboysVIP. That's GetJackBlack.com black.com slash cowboys with the code cowboys vip todd thought it would be secure to jog in the cheetah savannah todd believed the big cat repellent he bought online was reliable and now todd is trying to be faster than this cheetah that can run 80 miles per hour <laughs> but the good news is todd has at&t 5g that is fast reliable and secure and he learned the best thing to do is stop running and toss her the backpack with the beef stew at&t 5g fast reliable secure it's not complicated 5G requires compatible plan and device. 5G may not be available in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. Back to Talking Cowboys. Back here on Talking Cowboys, presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company, the official coffee of the Dallas Cowboys. This segment is brought to you by Invisalign, the official smile of the Dallas Cowboys. Not a ton of smiles from Cowboys Nation today, though. Cowboys fall to the Arizona Cardinals, 28-16, the final score in Week 3 of the NFL season. Back here with Nick Harris and Isaiah Stanback. I'm Kyle Yeomans. Breaking down the loss, the Cowboys fall to 2-1. and one. They'll look to rebound this week at home against the New England Patriots. But let's talk about the injuries going into week four because Friday we sat here on this show. We looked across 
the the, the hallway and said, "Wow, Ty, Tyler Smith looks like he's on his way back. We're going to get Tyler Tyler Smith back in the fold, starting five offensive linemen for the first time since 2021. All those guys since Tyler Smith has been drafted, they have not played a single snap of football where all five guys have been on the field. Madness, all five. Erroneous. We were so close this week, and then it just crumbles. Yeah, and then it crumbled in a way that we did could not expect. Right. Tyler Biotish, out. Yep. Mm. Zach Martin, out. Mm. Tyron Smith, padded up, worked out beforehand, tried to go, didn't go, out. Yep. Three starting offensive linemen. Tyler Smith was back in the fold. It was good to see him back out there and working. I'm sure he would have liked a ramp-up period instead of being the cornerstone of the offensive line. I thought he did a nice job. We'll have to go back and watch the film a little bit more, but... I think for the most part he did did a decent job. The other side was not going. His, his neighbor, his neighbor had a, had a rough day. The Chuma Doga. I really feel like Chuma's a better guard. He is. And he's got the he's got the skill set and the traits that his his body just looks like a guard. I would have liked to have seen Tyler at left tackle and move in Chuma at left guard, mm. but we didn't see that at all yesterday. Um, I, I will say this offensive line once they settled in, they settled in and they did mm. a really good job. Job. T.J. Bass had an awesome day, and mm. I'm I'm really excited to go back and, and watch the film on him. But you you can't look at this loss and, and look at the offensive line and be like, well, you know, maybe if we had all three of our guys up front no it's not the case not in my opinion really if, if, if the starting five was up front they still lose that game yesterday yeah because it was, it was problems so. for the most part outside yep. of that do you think the injury news because it did happen so late in the week it happened basically saturday was when news started kind of surfacing that these guys could be out yeah. do you think that deflated the energy because already they took a hit on thursday with trayvon dix you kind of knew that one you had a chance to at least let that sink in and, and motivate you going into the week. But then, boom, 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 up front on the offensive line, all three of those guys go down. I think that's got to be deflating for anybody, whether or not you're going to admit to it. Yeah, it definitely has to be. A lot of uh, people in the locker room yesterday were talking about the adversity that they had to overcome, not only during the week, but late in the week. You know, the Diggs injury happened Thursday. Um, the the Biotish injury happened Thursday. The Tyron Smith injury happened Saturday. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff that they had to battle in the week. I mean, they didn't they didn't know that Tyron Smith wouldn't be able to go until he worked out on the field pregame. Um, and uh, he was he was going off the field pregame right as you know players were still coming in because he had taken the early bus to, to State Farm Stadium, and it, it kind of looked like from that sense that he wasn't going to be able to go, and so they had to readjust from that moment, which was about two and a half hours before kickoff. Um, and having that type of time, I mean, that's tough in preparation when you could be preparing for other things, when you could be pre preparing for, you know, um, you, as we just saw, as, uh, discussed last week, all the different looks that they were going to see defensively. I mean, that was that was things that they could have prepared on in that sense, and they weren't able to because they were having to prepare to start three different guys up front. <laughs> Jeez. Crazy. I do believe it had an effect on the game, simply because of the fact Dak was under pressure. Mm -hmm. Dak was not comfortable. Yesterday, um, I don't think that it swayed the game heavily, but I do believe that it had an effect on their offense and the things that they wanted to do offensively because they were under way more pressure than they had been in the first two games. And Dak was unable to sit back on his back leg. We know, you know, that Dak, you just can't, you can't put pressure on him. You yeah. can't, can't allow for it. And you can't also allow for him to throw the ball 40 times. Yeah, but I think the quick game was effective. I mean, well, what yeah. they did, it was it was effective, and it, it it should have worked. Michael Gallup woke up. Michael Gallup, man, I would love to get into that at some point this week. He was awesome. He was, I mean, a couple of jump balls that they they gave him one on one opportunities on. He brought him down, fighting for extra yardage, getting mm -hmm. first downs. That was one of the biggest positives to take away Absolutely. from yesterday is the fact that wide receiver three is back. <laughs> yeah, and the only target that he didn't catch was the one that was in the back of the end zone. Yeah, that was a pi that was not called a pi. Got the they, they, they picked the flag up. We talked about it in studio. Barry Church agreed that it was a no call. What were your thoughts on C.D. Lamb and the resurgence of his body language? Body language, the, the bad specifically. Body language. Um, I uh, I didn't know this was a talking point with you guys. Um, it was last year. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, the, so the one where he was missed on the 45, 50 yard touchdown. He was there was definitely some body language after that because he was open. I mean, it was tough, and he kind of lodged back to the line a little bit, came in a little slow, uh, got the call in late, and um, I think they had to snap with like two on the clock. I'm not saying it was a, a, a um, directive to him, but that was a moment for me. Um, 
obviously after the PI call in the end zone or missed PI call in the end zone. I don't think that was PI. Was I think the Gallup one was way closer than the CD one was. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, but yeah, it, it probably wasn't great. I, I would like to see him just kind of be alpha in those moments and didn't really see that. Yeah, don't don't look for the flag. Look for the ball. And yeah, try and make yeah. a try and make a play, especially on third down. Yeah, yeah, especially on third I, down. I felt like just being candid. I feel like he's took a step back this week in terms of his yeah. how he was carrying himself, the leadership role he was really stepping into. I feel like he went back to what he was recent of last year. Um, and it was not. It, it wasn't encouraging. I hated. I hated seeing it. And uh, a lot of people would feel like that's not a big, big aspect of the game. I, those are the little things that I, at least I pay attention to. I know I mentioned it to Kyle and those guys in the studio yesterday. When we were watching the game. I was like, uh oh, here it goes. Here, here, let's go. You mean stomp that out? Like, don't let that fire get going again, right? You know, what I'm saying it's like you're doing fireworks. Like, hey, stomp that grass out real quick. You know, I hope that 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 he sees that and he, he self corrects himself to get back on the course that he was on because you can't allow that to creep in. You cannot allow that to creep in. You can be as frustrated as you want to, but everybody sees that. I had bad body language, so I'm fully aware of what that looks like. Most of the time, you're not even mad about everybody else. You're frustrated with yourself, right? But it appears as if you're down and out about everything else that's yeah. going on. So. He just. I hope that he's more aware of that, or somebody at least brings that to his attention. I've I've got to bring it up to Isaiah at least once a week on this show. <laughs> no, I just got to get that. You got to get the the body language taken care of. You know. Yep. What do we make of Brandon Cooks' two receptions mm. on seven targets and mm. only seventeen yards yesterday? What Not do we make of that? Like I, him being the speed option, he should work in this offense. He should have worked yesterday. Why didn't he work yesterday? Mm. That's that's going to be a big key of my film watch today. What did you see, Isaiah? Just I have to watch off more. Off the rip. I have to watch more, but I, I from what I saw, mm -hmm. I don't think that his routes were as crisp as we've seen him do in the past. Because you've been very critical of Gallup's routes, of, of yeah. not being able to get out of a break. I still don't believe that Gallup is getting out of his breaks. I think yeah. that what he does well, which we talked about last week, I said he still can make the contested catch. And he, he still can straight. run straight. Um, obviously, a slant route, he can run that. But a lot of those comebacks and, and, and curls and a lot of those things, he's a little slow to come out the breaks. And I just, you know, that is what it is. Cooks is normally your route guy. And... I haven't watched enough of it yet to be able to make a full conclusion, but from the, some of the routes that I was paying attention to, he was not very precise with his routes. And some of those routes you have to be precise with. I mean, especially the one down in the red zone that Dak threw. Would he have been open even if he would have ran a precise route? No. But, you know, you still have to do your part. Yeah. What did you think about Cooks and, and what you saw off the rip? Yeah, as far as the initial watch yesterday from the back corner of the uh, end zone and the, over the press box was at State Farm Stadium. Yeah, they took you guys <laughs> back there, don't they? Yeah, but it, honestly, uh -huh. it was it was a great time. We had a, it was one of the cooler uh, stadiums I've been to. But um, I again, I'm gonna have to go back and watch film. But I, it just it, it felt like he was getting out physicaled at times, um, and he wasn't able to get inside off his release. And I think they were doing a really good job of preventing that. Um, I, a couple of times he was, and a couple of times he got receptions. But um, the, the fact that he couldn't get downfield and break the uh, break the offense open downfield, I, I, th I think that was a really big key indicator. But also this offense yesterday wasn't designed to get people open downfield. Nope. And that's what him and Gallup, do best at times and even cd i mean cd i mean he's really good in that short to intermediate game but like these are downfield weapons and they weren't playing to those strengths yesterday i understand not wanting to do that with three offensive linemen out up front but those guys settled in by the third fourth quarter take those shots you're down 10 <laughs> you know like take those shots those those five six minute drives uh, it, it's not it's not going to be effective at the end of the day let's say dak ends up scoring on that um uh, play that he threw the interception on in the end zone let's mm -hmm. say they get a touchdown there cut it to what that would have been 20 28 23 or yeah yeah 28 23 there was only three and a half four minutes on the clock and you were working with two timeouts they had drove they had taken five minutes off the clock driving down the field and they were taking their sweet time in the red zone too so mm -hmm. i mean i just want to see more downfield opportunities for a lot of these guys but especially brandon cooks because that's what he was brought here to do we talked about him coming in this season oh a thousand yard type guy you know he's gotten it with what five different teams you know this is an opportunity for him to do it with the sixth team 39 yards in three weeks i understand he didn't play in week two but 39 yards in three weeks you got to get him open well Nick, i think it goes back to what we've talked about with the west coast scheme in general is the fact that it's predicated on playing with the lead sure, yeah. Yeah. And, and the defense setting the tone if the defense doesn't do their job and doesn't set the tone then the offense is going to have a tough time playing from behind and we saw that on sunday so are you saying that the offense cannot win a game this year it's going to have to be the defense <laughs> is that what is, is that what it is right now yeah <laughs> yeah actually yeah i, I mean i will then, say that because 
I think the, the offense can win a game. Say yeah. with your chest Monday. But it can't be it, – it's got to be from ahead. You either got to go down and score first. When you get the ball, you, you, you choose to receive or whatever the other team no. defers. You go down, you score. Okay? that That's the way that the offense can set the tone. You got to do that right off the jump. But then from a defensive standpoint, if you're on the field first, you can't allow for points first. And then a three and out from your offense. And then a touchdown with James Conner to make it nine to nothing. Even with a missed two point conversion, you're down by two scores. Yeah. That's that's the type of scenario that puts this offense in a bind. That's the type of thing that by that point you're down by two scores. It's like, okay, where are you gonna get those two scores? You're gonna have to have a turnover, you're gonna have to have a, a stop. Then your defense has to win you games if you're playing from behind. The offense can win you games, no doubt about it, but they've got to start ahead in order for the offense to win you games. The offense is not going to win a game for you behind. It's going to have to start with your defense. You know, and that's a question for Mike McCarthy today, whether it be from here or anybody else, is what what's the reason of not going downfield? What was the reason of taking these five, six-minute drives when you were down two possessions in the second half? I bet you his, his answer is offensive line. Yeah, that I mean, just for sure. Like a Mike for sure. Answer, I mean, yeah. and that's and that's that's very valid. But at the end of the day, you're still down two possessions. You got to take those shots. No doubt. No doubt. All right. Real quickly before we get out of here, one position group because this was a complete team loss, as were the first two weeks complete team wins. What is one position group that has to see a major improvement going into week four? Linebackers. Linebackers. Okay. We'll talk more about that. I think tomorrow, maybe maybe even Wednesday. What do you think? Secondary, okay. Cornerback specifically, without Trayvon, mm-hmm. making and, and these guys. I mean, this New England's going to throw the ball, so yeah. You think they throw it more than they run it? I do. Mm, that's interesting. That'll be a fun breakdown coming up on Thursday. Keep in mind, we will be here all week. We've got plenty more to come. John Machota will be back with us tomorrow. We'll also be taking your phone calls, 888-855-2297, and then the text messages as well, 817-290-3298. You can use both of those lines starting right now, 10 a.m. Central Time. Cowboy Storyline with Nick Eatman begins. He's taking all the fan calls. It's the first loss of the year for Nick Eatman on Cowboy Storyline, so you might want to line those phone calls up now. I saw him tweeting last night. He's like, it's going to be an interesting episode tomorrow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, may, I may have to tune in with that one. We're, we're busy upstairs, but I'm going to tune in today. I'm going to make, make an effort to make that happen. But that does it for us here on Talking Cowboys. The Cowboys fall in week three, 28 to 16 to the Arizona Cardinals. They'll try and get back after it. We'll get back get back after it tomorrow morning 9 a.m central time here from the star in frisco for chris beam isaiah Stanback, nick harris i'm kyle yeoman saying so long from the star in frisco we'll see you tomorrow on talking cowboys this has been a production of dallascowboys.com and the dallas cowboys football club how about this cowboys yeah!